Next up, uh, we have large-scale deployment of SMPTE 2110, the, live I, the IP Live production facility. Uh, this is with Chris Swisher. Uh, he's the Director of Production Systems Engineering at NBC Universal, where he focuses on design and build of new television production facilities based around SMPTE 2110 and related technologies. He is a liaison to manufacturing partners to inform the development of SMPTE ST2110 based technologies and control systems for use in large scale production environments. We also have Steve uh, Snedden. He's a VP of Production Engineering at NBC Universal, where he oversees the design, build, and support of technical facilities and infrastructure across NBCU's live production locations at 30 Rock in New York City for, uh, and for MSNBC and the NBC Network, Telemundo Center, Miami, Universal City Studios, Los Angeles. Steve has 20 years of experience in large-scale broadcast technology with the f past 15 at NBC Universal. So gentlemen, please come up. Hello. Thank you, and thank you, Thomas, and thank you for having us here. So I'm Steve Snedden. I'm VP of Production Engineering at NBC Universal. I'm here with Chris Swisher, who's Director of Production Engineering for NBCU. So together, we're going to take you through the build of Telmundo Center, one of the world's largest 2110 facilities. Um, but before we get into the sort of technical meat of the presentation, I just want to give a quick overview of both Telmundo and Telmundo Center. Uh, NBC Universal Telemundo Enterprises is a media company specializing in the production and distribution of high quality Spanish language content to U.S. audiences and audiences around the world. Um, in 2016, we at NBC Universal broke ground on a project to design and build Telemundo Center, the new global headquarters for Telemundo Enterprises in Miami, Florida. The purpose of the new facility was to bring together a combination of offices, studios for, for Telemundo Network, Telemundo Studios, Telemundo International, Universal Network, as well as being the home of NBC Universal International's Latin America offices. So prior to opening Telemundo Center, the staff of Telemundo Enterprises had been located at many facilities that were much older around the Miami metro area. And the, Telemundo Center allowed for all groups within the Telemundo Enterprises umbrella to come together under one roof in a modern facility. Apart from bringing business units together, one of the main goals of the project was to make the facility as technically and future-proof as possible to be able to allow Telemundo to uh, evolve into an evolving media landscape. So we feel that 2110 was a big part of that success there. All right. So, about the building. 500,000 square feet with room for 1,500 employees. Ample parking, which if anyone's been to the older Telemundo facilities, you'll know that they had anything but ample parking. Um, physical construction began in 2016. Um, initially, areas like the equipment rooms were designed with um, an SDI plant in mind. So it meant that there was a lot of uh, racks and a lot of room under the floor for cables. And we'll talk in a minute about how we got from a, an initial SDI plant design into an all IP plant. But the IP design was settled on the summer of 2017 and physical integration began around that time. Uh, and the on-air date was spring of 2018. Um, the big on-air driver was 31 days of coverage of the FIFA World Cup, uh, which um, was a premier event for Telemundo and a great way to showcase the new building. So, as you can imagine, missing that date was not an option. Um, just a little more detail on the, on the um, building here. So, 13 production studios, various sizes up to 8,000 square feet, used for a combination of news, sports programming, as well as more cinematic type episodic production. So about 50-50 split um, of those two use cases. Uh, five live production control rooms, um, all of which are identical to each other. Uh, 72 edit seats, approximately half of which are desktop edit and half of which are edit rooms. 60 graphics creation seats, 
a central video playback area, a central graphics playback area, a central camera shading area, and a central transmission operations center. So I use the word central a lot there, and um, the goal being that you know, all of those facilities could be shared with all of the productions that are going on simultaneously. Nothing's landlocked to a studio or control room. And again, the IP fabric and infrastructure was a big part of making that happen. So at the heart of the central equipment room was a set of uh, redundant core IP video routers using 2110. So as I mentioned earlier, Telemundo Center was not initially planned as an IP facility. If you think way back to 2016, which seems like an eternity, but was only three years ago, um, IP still felt like an emerging technology. And while 2022-6 existed and TRO3 was on its way to becoming 2110, it was not obvious that everything would come together to be enterprise ready by 2018, which as someone who needed to deliver a facility in mid-2018 was difficult. Um, However, I think a lot of hard work by VSF and SMPTE and a lot of other industry groups got the manufacturing community and us to a place where we needed to be by launch in 2018. So, look, you've all heard a, uh, a lot of the macro benefits about IP versus SDI and these types of events, so I'm gonna, won't go through those here, but what I will say is that our chief consideration around going IP was scale and software-defined reconfigurability. So I'm going to turn it over to Chris here to kind of take the rest of the, the presentation here. And he's going to talk through some of the design patterns that we considered and then what we sort of landed on. Thank you, Steve. Uh, okay, so let's see, here's my pointer here. Okay, so um, we want to start with um, some of the, 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 the video network topology consideration. So um, you can see this as a little bit of sort of like a roadmap to help broadcasters understand, you know, what they should be thinking about um, when uh, building out a 2110 environment, obviously sort of the, the path that we went down. So um, from a video network topology perspective, we can consider basically three classes of physical topology. I'm going to start with the fat tree network. So that's like your sort of classic office campus network, um, typically assumes link over subscription, we're going to just cross that right out right now, not recommended for uncompressed video, okay? So anyone who thinks you're going to just be running 2110 on your existing corporate network, um, you should move on from that. Um, uh, next we have Leaf Spine Network, so also referred to sometimes as a CLO network. Um, in a leaf spine network, endpoints are connected to leaf switches offering you know, low bandwidth ports to endpoints and high bandwidth uplinks to a small number of centralized spines. Um, uh, this, is this type of network is increasingly uh, popular for um, modern uh, data center applications. Um, in a 2110 environment specifically, it can offer some interesting optionality around physical distribution of the network in the plant so you can co-locate uh, leaf switches with the endpoints wherever they happen to be and then just have long pulls back to the, um, to the centralized spines. Um, finally, the single tier networks. This is kind of the most simple and streamlined. So this is a network in which the, there's no sort of built-in presumption of aggregation where you can have a single large core to your network that might offer some thousands of low bandwidth ports. Um, it's nice and clean and streamlined for broadcast engineering types. It's the thing that looks the most like a video router, which can be compelling. Um, though, of course, uh, you do have options for additional aggregation like you enjoy with the Leaf Spine network if you kind of want to get into that. Okay, video network control. So we're gonna envision sort of two paradigms of video network control here, which I'm gonna term hardware and software control. So hardware control is basically your classic IP network environment. It is a distributed intelligence model in which every node on the network is forwarding packets based on rules that it knows, okay? Um, software controlled networking, software defined networking, this is again an emerging technology that is becoming increasingly popular in data center applications where essentially what we do is take the brain of all those switches and kind of pull it out and instead have a centralized intelligence that is instructing switches um, to forward packets based on explicit rules. 
Okay, uh, network redundancy. So whether you go with a single tier or a leaf spine network, you are gonna wanna build a redundant network. I'm gonna show them here as red, blue, you can call them X, Y, whatever you please. Um, uh, uh, remember in that leaf spine network, even though we had sort of that pair of core switches, right, that is just a single leg of the redundant network. 2022-7, uh, um, I won't go into great detail about how that works, but you understand every sender has dual NICs connected to each of the redundant networks. Every stream is outputted identically, uh, with identical payloads to each network and identical RT TP timestamps and sequence numbers. Um, uh, receivers then are also, of course, dual nicked, and they are able to uh, look at uh, incoming traffic on a per packet basis and perform hitless merge um, against them. So I think you know the key points I want to make about 2022-7 uh, here are one, do it. Um, as you build out large environments like Telemundo Center, um, your, your egg to basket ratio in terms of devices on video, uh, you know, infrastructure starts getting real big real fast. Uh, and, uh, you know, redundancy is a gift of IP video. It should be enjoyed. But um, I think it's important to remember that the use of redundant networks in 2022-7 does not by itself convey the property of bulletproofness to your network. Um, uh, you know, if you, if a single endpoint fails, uh, neither side of that redundant leg is going to work. Um, if you have uh, a failure on, say, the sender's uh, red side and the receiver's blue side, it's also not going to work. So uh, employ redundancy, but uh, be serious about it. Make sure that you're uh, monitoring redundant leak links, and if one side fails, don't let it, you know, sit like that. Uh, okay, PTP distribution. So again, I'm gonna sort of, sort of uh, hearkening back to the hardware and software controlled analogy we talked about uh, for network control. Um, what I'm gonna call distributed PTP here is one in which network nodes themselves can act as boundary clocks. Um, this is the kind of network that in our estimation is really rife for the kind of uh, security concerns that we heard about in the previous, um, the previous presentation. Um, uh, for Telemundo Center, we developed a new solution which I like to think of as a centralized PTP, where um, instead of uh, having, you know, uh, allowing BMCA to sort of just work on its own across the network, we really explicitly carved up the network environment so that we have very specifically isolated tiers, grandmasters, and boundary clocks uh, with the network nodes themselves being non-PTP aware. Okay, a little more detail on that. So what does this thing look like? At Telemundo Center, we have a top tier of four GPS uh, locked grandmaster clocks. Those are uh, the GPS antennas distributed across the roof, so they're a little, they're physically diverse to prevent, um, you know, events like lightning, water, a you know, baseball bat from impacting any two of them. Um, those are cross-connected to a redundant pair of non-PTP aware distribution, PTP distribution switches, which then also feed um, sets of paired boundary clocks, which are PTP locked to those grandmasters. So that right there is an isolated grandmaster, PTP distribution, and slave boundary tiers. Um, and we don't allow any other devices sort of south of that to assume clock, uh, to, to assume a, a master status over any devices. Um, those pairs of boundary clocks then are, of course, cross-connected to the red and blue networks. Um, uh, for access to endpoints. Now, um, Telemundo Center, like really any 2110 uh, environment you're going to build uh, at this, certainly in 2017, but also in 2019, is still going to have a need for legacy analog reference signals. Um, and so we built that right into our solution here, where we deployed, again, another set of those boundary clocks, um, which is connected to a uh, changeover switch to provide black bursts uh, for legacy devices. So at the end of that, you see any one endpoint is getting PTP from the X side, PTP from the Y side, and black burst as needed. And most devices are getting all three. Um, so the one, you you know, the way that we were able to, um, uh, from an endpoint perspective, they are still performing BCMA. However, they only are able to see just one single pair of those uh, boundary clocks. So we carve up the network into essentially what we, what we call PTP islands using um, static routing uh, so that any group of endpoints only sees a single pair of boundary clocks and they perform BCMA only between the two of them. Uh, we found that that really helps kind of smooth out performance and um, provide deterministic performance in the network. Okay, so let's put it all together. A summary architecture for Telemundo Center. So the uh, SMPTE 2110 uh, environment is a pair of single tier networks. I'll talk about what I mean by a pair. Uh, with, like I said, 2022-7 redundancy, you gotta do it. Uh, we have the centralized PTP model I described on the previous side, and we do have a software-defined control layer. 
Um, so I said dual network. So uh, as you see here, well, we actually have two non-blocking networks at Telemundo Center, uh, which we term the production and acquisition networks. Um, they are, like I say, they are non-blocking within their own environment, but we have a large set of uh, managed tie lines between them. So wh what are we connecting to all those things? Like Steve said, scale. Um, the goal of Telemundo Center was all about large scale and software reconfigurability. So what we have on the production network is all of the source devices associated with production studios and production control rooms um, uh, connected to the one non-blocking network. So that's camera CCUs, graphics devices, DDRs, production switches, audio mixers, various kinds of processing, including our multi-viewers. Um, we kind of have sort of demoted the sort of the user space of the control room to what we like to call the lightweight front end. Um, so that's, um, those ports are also on the production router. Um, that includes uh, studio BSP connections and uh, uh, audio and video monitoring in the production control room itself. On the acquisition network, we have all of the IOs associated with transmission, uh, uh, in, in and out of the building, uh, ingest systems, and post-production. Okay, so huge amount of complexity. I said software, uh, Steve said software defined reconfigurability. So how do we achieve that? Okay, I'm gonna talk a little bit about operational presentation. Okay, so a lot of stuff on that router, some thousands of IOs. How do we present that to the users? Well, um, certainly one version of this would be to have some kind of high-level orchestration system that would just kind of figure it all out and, uh, and, and hand it down to us. That's what I'm gonna call a top-down approach, okay? Uh, what we went for instead was what I like to call a bottom-up approach. So forgive me that I sort of drew this diagram backwards for that, but um, we have a Telemundo Center employed an extensive use of virtual loopback routing within our router control system. Okay, so these are IOs on the router that take up neither physical ports nor bandwidth, and we use them for operational presentation of pooled resources to the production control environment. So rather than forcing the operation to, you know, look at it, so if we have, for example, 80 camera CCUs at Telemundo Center. Um, so rather than having the operation call CAM 43 today, CAM 5 tomorrow, we present the those using virtual loopback routing as a localized CAM1 and CAM2 to the control room. And of course, every control room has their own set of that. Now, the thing that I really like about this is that because I say it's bottom up, all of these assignments can be expressed as a route event on the system which means that the operation can perform these assignments on a one-off basis, they can build them into salvos. It also means that we can at any future time add an uh, intelligent orchestration system to do you know, scheduling the resource, pooled resource assignment, that kind of stuff. And that can sort of do all that business logic but then execute those tasks as route events against the underlying system. So it's a really flexible solution um, that uh, we're not even beginning to sort of uh, uncover the full potential of. Okay, so now I wanna talk a little bit about what's missing in IP video today, certainly in 2019, but all these things are still true today. Um, uh, stream, common standards for stream subscription control. Um, uh, I've, I've, I've had a lot of conversations with vendors where I say, does your, does your product interop with my control system? And they say, yeah, just as soon as we have NMOS. Um, the stream subscription problem is real. Um, I would like to, you know, ask everyone to be understanding that that's, that's a problem that we as broadcast, that, broadcasters face, and if, if we've all agreed that NMOS is a solution to that, let's be working on it, because I'm not seeing uh, broad availability right now. Um, I want to say, too, stream subscription control, uh, kind of going along with that is route switching mechanisms. If we're doing break before make, join before leave, there is no commonality uh, across vendors for that right now. Um, common audio multicast packaging. In the 2110-30 multicast, we have seen vendors support one, two, four, eight, 16 streams uh, with, and everyone sort of picks their standard and says, well, that's what we use. Um, so that has made multi-vendor interop a real challenge for us. Um, I'd like to see that get smoothed out. The IPGPI, Common Device Control Protocols, I think you guys are gonna be hearing more about this in the next speech, uh, in the next presentation, uh, so I won't belabor it, but as we move systems to, uh, solutions to software-based systems away from hardware appliances, uh, we've struggled to find the replacement for GPIs and serial connectivity. There is no sort of shared IP standard that uh, covers those needs, it's been a challenge. Um, finally, advanced support for ancillary data. I'm talking about the 2110-40 stream. Um, I look forward to any interesting application of that stream that we can start employing in our environments. Uh, we are routing the Dash 40 streams, but for today we just assume that they need to flow with the source video that they came in with. Um, 
Uh, we'd like to see solutions where we can stack ancillary data streams to provide different kinds of ancillary data packages to outputs. Um, that could work something like, you know, like an like a seri like a, um, SDI pass-through embedders wired in series. Uh, but today, that's basically literally what we have to do because we can't do anything interesting with it. Okay, uh, last page, I promise, lessons learned. So, uh, first lesson learned, diverse networks are okay. I already showed you guys we have the production and acquisition networks. Um, that's, not the, that's not the whole of it. You know, we also have um, separate networks for different kinds of audio formats. Um, broadcasters should not feel that a single non-blocking network for every single device in the plant is a minimum requirement to embark on a 2110 build. You can have diversity in your networks, and that's okay. Um, IP wiring is easy, but config is hard. So if you think back again to the yesteryear of SDI technology, we made workflow decisions at system design time, and we rendered them in metal by wiring devices, the jack fields to other devices. And it took a long time to wire that stuff up, but once it was done, you turn everything on, and it, like lo and behold, it did what you thought it was gonna do. In an IP build, you just, you know, essentially wire every device to the same one network, but when you turn it on, there's no workflow embedded in the physical build, okay? So what this means is that there's an extended period that I, I've sort of termed for my clients the soft build time, uh, which, uh, you know, we need to sort of set up all the soft configs and everything that sort of uh, bring the workflow to life in the plant. From a, from a bare project management perspective, that means that uh, you need to allow more time between the conclusion of physical integration and the start of production readiness. Um, I said IP wiring is easy, but um, I, I do want to highlight we need to develop a strong fiber optic plan for your build. Um, uh, cert, obviously, fiber optic cabling is not unique to 2110. However, I would expect that uh, any broadcaster embarking on a large 2110 build, is, that's probably going to be the most fiber intensive project they've done so far. There's a lot to consider in a fiber optic plan, and you need to think it through. Where you intend to do cross patching, where you're going to be, you know, how you're going to be bundling fiber cables. Obviously, single mode versus multi mode, that feeds back into the single tier versus leaf spine um, uh, topologies we discussed earlier. Um, also, be serious about a program of fiber cleaning. Uh, I can't stress that enough. Uh, all the, 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 the place where we see the most sort of physical layer problems in 2110 builds is with dirty fiber, and it's avoidable if you just clean properly. Okay. Uh, okay, finally, last thought. Um, every IP decap is a unique event. I like to close on this because I think this is where I really started to really see the... It, 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 the ways in which an IP video environment are different from SDI. Uh, obviously, in any sort of encoded data transmission, every receiver of that needs to decode it on its own, right? But it, in SDI, we got, you know, we got, we've long been at a point where you can expect every receiver of an SDI stream is going to do the same thing with it. In IP today, that's still not necessarily true. Um, I like to say that it's even less analog than digital was in the sense that we sort of allow ourselves to imagine that streams on the network have some persistent reality, but really it's just a set of instructions to computers to perform tasks, and different endpoint devices may perform those tasks differently. Um, the things I like to highlight there, audio-video synchronization, which obviously has, has PTP implications. Um, 2022-7 uh, uh, performance. Uh, we see different endpoint devices are, have slightly diff different capabilities around um, uh, redundant performance. Uh, and finally, uh, seamless switching. So uh, I like to close with this anecdote. We had at uh, Telemundo Center, we, uh, we had this workflow where we use one of these virtual loopbacks to, to do a live switch in the program path. And as we were sort of doing our rehearsals heading up to the World Cup, um, the control room started to freak out about the fact that when they did this live switch, it was glitching on the wall. And uh, we, you know, we looked into it. we looked into it, and we realized that it was actually not glitching um, on the transmission path. And that's because the endpoints they are receiving that virtual switch stream formed a, a seamless switch, but our multi viewers in the control room took a hit. Um, so, you know, that was an education for us, uh, and it, it helped kind of helped us understand, you know, the ways in which IP twenty one ten is like SDI, and the ways it's not. And um, you know, we all I don't know we all grew and or the better for it. So um, that's it for me. Thank you very much. I don't know if we have time for questions. Great. We have a few minutes for questions. Uh, we've got a microphone right there in the, uh, the center aisle if anybody would like to come and ask a question. And we've got some. Please state your name and affiliation and question. Hello. I'm Jonathan with uh, CBC. Hi, sir. So we are 
ongoing <clears throat> the same process that you've been going through. Yeah. And I wonder, uh, what's your go-to test equipment or debug method for uh, this brand new world? Uh, so you're talking about like specific like test test devices, test devices or software or whatever. I actually really think this comes back to the the last point he just yeah. made there is that, you know, the the test equipment may have different characteristics than the um, yeah. the endpoint that you're trying to work with. Yeah. So actually, the um, test equipment in the SDI realm, w when we're handing off to SDI, has been, you know, kind of the the go-to still because we need to check the performance after the whatever is doing the, the conversion back to SDI at the end of the chain. Yeah, yeah it's, it's been a real challenge because, I mean, you were, you're, there's no scenario here where you're you know, patching into a jack field to interrupt the signal, right? What you're gonna end up doing is sending a 2110 stream to a different device, to a different set of network switches, and that, like, like Steve, you know, like we said, it may perform it differently. Um, you know, that's, that is a challenge for us. Um, I really don't have a good answer for that. If anyone else does, we'd love to hear it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, any other questions? I'll, I'll ask a quick question. So, how do your operations staff feel about the new IP plant? Are they are they happy? Uh, are they sad? <laughs> you know, so when you say I, I, I no, nobody's sad. Here. Nobody, yeah, nobody's <laughs> sad here. I just, you know, yeah. No, I, I want to say they're happy. You know, I uh, it's uh, the, the whole you know bit I did about operational presentation. The goal there was to essentially simulate the SDI environment inside the IP environment. And that was something we worked really hard on for them, is to make it as little as possible something that they even needed to be aware of. And I, I really feel like we achieved that goal. You know, it's why I, I like to sort of tell that story about the, the, that, you know, how the multi-viewers performed the glitches, because that was really the first time that anyone in the control room ever had to go, whoa, this is like different technology now. Uh, I think we've, I've been, I'm proud of how much success we've had making it transparent to the operation. Yeah, I mean, I think that, that software reconfigurability then added a layer of, um, of capabilities that were previously manual workflows yeah. um, that just suddenly became pushes of buttons. Yeah, yeah per, great example of that is, is camera CCU. So we used to do a huge amount of moving um, fiber cables around. Simpty. Yeah, yeah simply, simply fiber cables around um, to move, to patch cameras around in different control rooms. But now, because it's a pooled resource, we don't touch those cables. We've left our cameras basically perma-patched, and then we just change them around as route events. And they love that. It makes it so much easier to swing shows between um, studios and control rooms. Okay, guys. Well, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you.